Adam Johnson has offered one of the most unique moral arguments in recent memory in his book, Divine Love Theory. And his argument is attractive because he makes the most sustained attempt, which I have yet come across, to explain the connection between God and morality. That is, Johnson actually tries to do the work of explaining how it is that God is supposed to explain the existence of moral facts. Furthermore, he extensively contrasts his theistic model of morality with Eric Wielenberg's non-theistic model, attempting to show that his theistic model is superior. Johnson follows the basic ethical theory set forward by Robert Adams in his book, Finite and Infinite Goods. Adams proposed that certain actions were moral in virtue of their resembling God, saying, God is the supreme good, and the goodness of other things consists in a sort of resemblance to God. In this way, God functions as the standard for morality, and so God is necessary for its very existence. But Johnson goes further than Adams. He specifies that certain actions are moral, not merely in virtue of their resembling God, but rather in virtue of their resembling the eternal and perfect love which exists among the three persons of the Trinity. Johnson's moral theory is thus both inherently theistic and inherently Trinitarian. As he explains, I agree with Adams that the ultimate good is God, and that humans are morally good if they resemble God in a morally pertinent way. However, my divine love theory goes one step further by proposing that the specific thing being resembled in God's Trinitarian nature as found in and expressed among the loving relationships between the persons of the Trinity. Therefore, I propose that God's inner Trinitarian relationships provide the ultimate foundation for objective morality, and that humans are good when they resemble the loving divine relationships in a morally pertinent sense. Now immediately I do have some concerns about this account. I can see how, for example, goodness is being explained by reference to a relation between some action and God's love, but I do have some difficulty in seeing how this account explains evil. On the one hand, one might be tempted to say that an action is immoral to the extent that it does not resemble the love of God. But remember that good and evil are not binary categories which exhaust all types of actions. Most ethicists also recognize a category for amoral or non-moral actions. For example, the act of eating a glazed donut. Presumably Johnson does not think that eating a glazed donut resembles the love of the Trinity in a morally pertinent way. But presumably, also, Johnson does not want to claim that this action is therefore evil or immoral. So a question arises as to what makes an action immoral as opposed to merely non-moral. Merely not resembling God's love is insufficient to adjudicate between these categories. I don't think that this is a devastating objection to Johnson's model by any means. I suspect he could build something into it, which would explain why certain actions are immoral. So I won't harp on this point. For the purposes of this video, I am content to say that his account overcomes my second challenge for moral arguments. Johnson follows Walls, Baguette, and Evans by understanding moral obligations as being generated by God's commands. A pressing concern for those who wish to explain moral obligations by recourse to God is known as the problem of prior obligations. In short, the objection goes something like this. If God is the source of moral obligations, what is it that obligates people to obey those obligations? The question sets up a dilemma. If the proponent of divine command theory says that God also obligates us to obey his obligations, then there is a circularity problem. But if the obligation comes from somewhere else, then the divine command theorist has admitted that obligations can come from somewhere besides God, and therefore, God is not required for moral obligations at all. C. Stephen Evans summarizes the objection as follows. The prior obligations objection argues that there must be some moral obligations that are not grounded in divine commands because they hold antecedently to or independently of divine commands. Specifically, the claim is that humans have a moral obligation to obey God. This obligation is not itself grounded in God's commands. Rather, it is precisely because there is a prior obligation to obey God that God's commands can create new obligations. There must, therefore, be some obligations other than those that are created by God's commands. Now, I don't think that this is an insurmountable objection to theistic accounts of moral obligation, but I bring it up here because Johnson's answer to it creates difficulties for his arguments later on. 
Johnson approvingly cites John Hare's response to this objection. Hare grasps the second horn of the dilemma, arguing that the proposition that God ought to be obeyed is analytically true. He says, It is necessarily true that God is to be loved. We know this just by knowing the terms God and to be loved. This is because we know that if God exists, God is supremely good, and we know that what is supremely good is to be loved. It is also true that we know that to love God is at least to obey God. Loving God is not simply to repeat God's will and our will, because there are things God wills that God does not will for us to will. So what we are to repeat in our wills is God's will for our willing. But willing what God wills for our willing is obedience. So it is necessarily true, not just that God is to be loved, but that God is to be obeyed. This means that divine commands do not generate all our obligations because there is one important exception, namely the obligation to obey divine commands. And Johnson himself concludes, Our obligation to obey God's commands comes from the necessary truth that God should be loved. If God should be loved, and obeying God's commands is one of the primary ways we can love him, then we should obey his commands in order to love him. The fact God should be loved generates our moral obligation to obey God's commands. Hare and Johnson are clearly grasping the second horn of the dilemma, claiming that all moral obligations except for one come from God. It is, in my estimation, highly dubious, however, that the proposition that God ought to be obeyed is analytically true. A proposition is analytically true when it is true in virtue of what it means or by definition. An example here is all bachelors are men. The proposition is analytically true because being a man is part of the definition of the word bachelor. The difficulty for Hare and for Johnson is that they conclude that if God is by definition to be loved, then God is by definition to be obeyed. This requires that the words love and obedience be exact synonyms. But it seems clear that they are not, for we can think of countless examples where love and obedience can come apart. Consider the proposition that a parent ought to love their child. Does it follow from this that a parent ought to obey their child? Certainly not. Consider the proposition that a husband ought to love his wife. Does this mean that a husband ought to always obey his wife? Again, surely not. So love and obedience are not synonymous, and therefore it does not follow from the proposition that God is to be loved, that God must also be obeyed. It is not an analytic truth. But leaving aside for the moment that neither Hare nor Johnson gives us an explanation for how a truth, necessary or otherwise, is capable of generating obligations, and leaving aside the worry that the proposition that God ought to be obeyed is not in fact analytic at all, the salient point is that by grasping the second horn of the dilemma, Johnson is implicitly abandoning the idea that God is necessary for moral obligations. That is, he has committed himself to the proposition that necessarily true propositions are, at least in this one instance, capable of generating moral obligations without God having to issue such a command. This is, of course, a legitimate move for Johnson to make, but it creates serious problems for him later on, as we shall see. After laying out his moral theory, Johnson moves to compare it with Eric Wielenberg's Godless Normative Realism, for the sake of seeing which theory provides a better explanation for morality. He contends that his explanation is superior to Wielenberg's in at least four ways. Specifically, he maintains that a moral theory requires an exemplar for moral value, a human telos or purpose for moral obligation, a social context for moral obligation, and a head at the chain of moral obligation. Moreover, he maintains that his moral theory fulfills each of these requirements whereas Wielenberg's does not. It is important to note at the outset that only the first of these requirements pertains to moral facts. The other three pertain exclusively to moral obligation. This means that even if Johnson's account has an advantage on these latter three requirements, this will only support theism as a superior explanation of moral obligations and not of moral facts. In order for theism to also be a better explanation for moral facts, it is paramount that Johnson's first point holds. Again, this first point maintains that an exemplar is required for moral value. Why is that? Well, Johnson explains, The first element required for objective morality that my theory provides and Wielenberg's model does not 
is an ultimate standard for morality from which to judge whether other things are good. Without such a fixed absolute exemplar, there is no standard by which to measure whether something is good or bad. With a perfectly moral being as the exemplar, there's something by which we can measure the goodness of other things. Wielenberg's model has no such concrete exemplar. It's difficult to think how abstract brute ethical facts could serve as an exemplar when they have no moral value in and of themselves. While I am willing to grant that Johnson is correct that his theory contains a perfect exemplar for moral behavior and Wielenberg's does not, I am skeptical of his claim that such an exemplar is required for an adequate account of moral realism. What work is this exemplar supposed to be doing within the moral theory? As best I can tell, the exemplar is functioning in a strictly epistemological role. That is, the exemplar is supposed to be providing a reference guide by which to determine whether or not some action is moral or immoral. Now notice that this means that, as an exemplar, God is not serving to explain the existence of moral facts. He is merely serving to explain the existence of human knowledge of moral facts. But even if a moral exemplar were needed for moral knowledge, this does not make morality less objective on Wielenberg's view. Morality could still be objective, even if there were no way to determine what is and is not moral. So contrary to Johnson's claim, an exemplar of moral value is not needed for morality to be objective. At best, such an exemplar is needed for moral knowledge. But I suppose that Johnson is free to argue that his account still enjoys an advantage over Wielenberg's, because his theory has the resources to account for moral knowledge. However, this is not clearly true either, for the question may still be raised as to how one determines that their actions are resembling the exemplar of moral value. It seems that the theist is going to have to appeal to the same sorts of things which atheists appeal to, namely moral intuitions or properly functioning moral faculties or something of that nature. In other words, Theists and atheists are roughly equally matched when it comes to moral epistemology. The theist, therefore, needs to argue that theism has an advantage when it comes to explaining the existence of moral facts, not moral knowledge. Johnson's point, as best I can tell, does not establish this. As we move to consider Johnson's other three points, remember that each of them is solely concerned with moral obligation, meaning that even if he is right that theism has an explanatory advantage in these areas, this will only yield the conclusion that theism better explains the existence of moral obligations, but this will not automatically mean that theism better explains the existence of moral facts. With that being said, Johnson's second contention is that his theory can explain the existence of purpose, which, in his view, is needed for moral obligations. He says, My divine love theory, as opposed to Wielenberg's godless normative realism, contains a telos for human beings. As noted previously, I maintain that God's ultimate intention, or telos for humans, is that they join the communion of loving relationships among the persons of the Trinity. Once again, I am in agreement with Johnson that his theory includes the element of teleology due to his inclusion of an intentional agent, and Wielenberg's theory does not. However, I am unsure as to why he thinks that the element of teleology is required for moral obligations to be objective. Johnson approvingly cites many philosophers who agree with him upon the necessity of teleology for moral obligation. However, the only one who makes anything approaching an argument for this conclusion is Alice Dare McIntyre, who says, Unless there is a telos which transcends the limited goods of practices by constituting the good of a whole human life, it will both be the case that a certain subversive arbitrariness will invade the moral life and that we shall be unable to specify the context of certain virtues adequately. It seems that McIntyre is making an argument from consequence, according to which, if teleology is removed from obligation, then moral actions seem arbitrary, and it will be impossible to determine the context of certain virtues. McIntyre's latter point is epistemological in nature, and as such the objections which I raised against Johnson's earlier point apply to this one equally. In response to McIntyre's first point, it is unclear why obligation should become any more arbitrary without a purpose. Johnson's own theory has stipulated that at least one obligation, the so-called prior obligation to obey God's commands, can be generated by a necessary truth. 
If it is not arbitrary, in virtue of the obligation being a necessary truth, then the defender of Wielenberg's theory can just say that all obligations are necessary truths. Either way, Johnson's theory has not surpassed Wielenberg's. But Johnson still protests. Intentionality is a key difference between my divine love theory and Wielenberg's godless normative realism. With the former, there is an intentionality at the root of reality that provides the should required for objective morality. Without it, the dreaded fact-value dichotomy raises its ugly head once again. How can you get a should from an is? Johnson is here just assuming, without argument, that intentionality can generate objective obligations. But why think that? His question for Wielenberg equally applies to himself. How can Johnson get an ought out of the is known as intentionality? And again, Johnson has already conceded that necessary truth is sufficient to generate moral obligations, at least when it comes to explaining the existence of the human obligation to obey God. But then on what non-arbitrary grounds can Johnson block the same move by Wielenberg? Why can't Wielenberg just say that moral facts are necessary truths, and because of this, they are capable of generating moral obligations? It's going to be very difficult for Johnson to maintain that we ought to obey God is the only obligation which can be generated from a necessary truth if he wants to avoid special pleading. Johnson's third requirement for a moral theory is a social context for moral obligation. He writes, That God exists as a fellowship of three persons in loving relationships with each other provides a foundation for the relational context of moral obligation that Wielenberg's theory does not have. While he could similarly affirm that obligation arises from our relationships with other humans, compared with my divine love theory, his theory lacks a good explanation as to how and why this is the case. If Wielenberg is correct, then personal social relationships only arose accidentally through a contingent evolutionary process when humans evolved to such a level. My theory provides a better explanation for the relational context of reality that is so vital for the existence of moral obligation. An essentially personal and relational source of morality, God is Trinity, fits the personal aspect of our experience of morality better than Wielenberg's proposed impersonal Platonic source. While it is, of course, controversial that moral obligations do, in fact, depend upon a social context, and Johnson never argues for this thesis, I am willing enough to grant this for the sake of argument. Assuming that a social context is needed for obligations, it's very difficult to see what Johnson's argument is supposed to be. Surely he is not disputing that there can be societies in which moral obligations can exist on Wielenberg's model. So Wielenberg has no trouble accommodating a social context, and therefore he has no trouble explaining the existence of moral obligations. All that follows from the premise that obligations are social is that they require a society, not that they require a divine authority. As Mark Murphy points out, the key point here is that if the social character of obligation is understood in this holding responsible sense, there is nothing that mitigates in favor of obligatory norms originating in some authoritative party, whether an earthly sovereign, in the case of legal obligation, or a divine sovereign, in the case of moral obligation. What matters in either case is that there be some parties who have the standing to hold others responsible for their adherence to the relevant norms. But whether there are parties who are authorized to hold others responsible for adherence to the relevant norms is independent of whether the lawmaking source is in some sovereign like God, or in some set of customary rules, or in some set of norms that hold independently of anyone's willing or commanding. Johnson seems to think that he has an advantage in explaining why there is a society in the first place. If Wielenberg is right, the existence of human societies is just a cosmic accident in the greater scheme of things. Perhaps that is true, but why would that be relevant? Johnson is supposed to be arguing that theism better explains the existence of moral obligations in particular, not that theism better explains the existence of human societies, which also happen to be necessary for moral obligations. This would be like arguing that God is the best explanation for the existence of traffic circles, since traffic circles only make sense within a human society, and human societies couldn't exist without God. There is nothing about traffic circles in particular, as opposed to any other aspect of human society, which indicates theism. And the same applies to moral obligations. 
both Johnson's moral theory and Wielenberg's moral theory include human societies. The fact that human society may be accidental according to Wielenberg's theory does not make it any less of a reality. As such, both theories have the resources to explain the social nature of moral obligations. And if Johnson wants to argue for theism on the basis of him having a better explanation for human societies existing at all, then he has simply left the domain of moral arguments. Johnson is making some other type of argument for theism at that point. As a final point, and again returning to the problem of prior obligations, it seems that Johnson cannot consistently maintain that a social context is required for moral obligations. Remember how he answered the question of what obligates us to obey God. He said that our obligation to obey God's commands comes from the necessary truth that God should be loved. True, this is an inherently social proposition, but importantly, for Johnson, it is the fact that the proposition is necessarily true which is generating the moral obligation, not the fact that it is an inherently social proposition. Now, a proposition could be necessarily true even if it were not social in nature. And the upshot of this is that if Johnson is really committing himself to the position that necessary truths are sufficient to generate moral obligations in order to evade the prior obligations objection to divine command theory, then he has abandoned the notion that moral obligations require a social context. Thus, Johnson faces a dilemma. Either he keeps his response to the prior obligation objection and admits that he doesn't have a social context advantage over Wielenberg, or else he keeps his social context advantage over Wielenberg, but once again has to stare down the prior obligations objection. In short, he either loses his presumed advantage over Wielenberg, or else he has to face a much more serious objection to his theory. The final advantage which Johnson claims for his theory over against Wielenberg's is that his includes an authority figure, God, to issue moral obligations, and to whom people are accountable. He writes, If there's no God, we could possibly understand how the evolutionary process would have developed in us a strong subjective impulse to help people, but it doesn't seem plausible to suppose that we could have an objective obligation to do so that stems objectively from outside us. Or shall we say, it's more clearly the case that we do have objective obligations in such a scenario if there exists a God to whom we are accountable. Without an authority on the top of the moral hierarchy, it's unclear how there could be an ultimate objective moral accountability. Unfortunately, and as with most defenders of moral arguments for theism, Johnson offers us no account of what it means to be authoritative or for God to have authority. He closely associates the term with the concept of accountability. But this begins to look dangerously like saying that God has the authority to tell us what to do just because he has the power to enforce his own rules. If authority cannot be distinguished from power, then it becomes unclear how divine obligations are, in fact, objective at all. Just saying that God is authoritative is no explanation. Johnson points out that it's not clear where a stance independent moral obligation would come from given atheism, but it's also not clear where it would come from given theism. If obligations depend upon God's commands, then it seems like they are dependent on God's stances. But if they do, then they are not stance independent. As such, the existence of stance independent obligations becomes no less mysterious on Johnson's model than on Wielenberg's. Moreover, the inclusion of an authority in one's theory of moral obligations may be more of a theoretical vice than a virtue. Mark Murphy argues quite persuasively that the presumption is against any putative authority, such that any claims to authority require strong justification. He explains, There are strong reasons to think that, in the absence of good arguments for any of these authority theses, we should deny those theses rather than simply withhold belief with respect to them. We should do so because there is, in general, a reasonable presumption toward disbelief in authority relationships. If I were to claim that Will Clark is a practical authority over you, yet were to fail to offer you any evidence for this claim, you would not merely withhold belief on the question of Clark's practical authority over you. You would deny it. So in the vast run of cases, the presumption seems just right. The argumentative burden, thus, is on those who would reject it in the case of God's alleged authority over created rational beings. 
For unless one provides an argument for why the presumption applies to all other rational beings but not to God, one would be arbitrarily limiting the presumption's scope. If Murphy is right, and I think he is, then Johnson's inclusion of a personal authority in his meta-ethic not only fails to give him an advantage over Wielenberg, but actually puts him at a disadvantage. Johnson now has to justify the claim that God has authority over us before his meta-ethical theory will even be viable. And given that we're still trying to figure out whether or not he has even justified the proposition that God exists via a moral argument, it is very doubtful that he is going to be able to offer prior justification for the proposition that God exerts authority over us. In short, one has to justify the idea that God exists before they can justify the proposition that he holds any sort of authority over us. Finally, and as I have repeatedly pointed out throughout this video, Johnson's answer to the prior obligations objection creates problems for him here too, since he has already admitted that a necessary truth can generate the obligation that God ought to be obeyed without the need for a divine authority, then Wielenberg is free to make the same move and say that moral obligations are merely generated by necessary truths. I don't see a way for Johnson to block this move without engaging in special pleading. Johnson spends a considerable amount of space objecting both to Wielenberg's moral epistemology and to his metaphysical account of godless normative realism. Johnson titles his first objection to Wielenberg's model, The Bloated Model Objection. Despite the singular title, this section of Johnson's book actually details four objections to Wielenberg's model. First, he objects that there is a lack of evidence for brute ethical facts. He writes, It's difficult to argue against Wielenberg's assertion that these brute ethical facts exist because he provides no evidence or argument for them. But this isn't really an objection. Remember, Johnson is supposed to be engaging in theory comparison against Wielenberg, to show that theism is the better explanation for morality. Wielenberg no more has to prove the existence of abstract objects before considering them than Johnson has to prove the existence of God. How well the hypothesis does at explaining the relevant data is the evidence for the hypothesis. That's just how abductive reasoning works. It would be a significant misstep for atheists to insist that theists provide evidence for God before being able to propose God as being the best explanation for the universe, or for fine-tuning, or for morality. It is just as much of a misstep for Johnson to expect independent evidence for abstract objects from Wielenberg. He writes, We should ask, are there good reasons and evidence to believe that these brute ethical facts really exist? On the contrary, what we should ask is, which hypothesis, theism or Platonism, better explains moral facts? One doesn't have to justify the reality of an explanation before they propose it to explain a set of facts. Now immediately after making this objection to Wielenberg's model, Johnson's argument takes a strange turn. He admits that one does not have to justify the existence of some entity before positing its existence to explain certain facts, saying, To be consistent, theists who make moral arguments for God must at least admit that Wielenberg's abductive approach is viable. Quite so. Why, then, has Johnson raised this as one of his four objections to Wielenberg's model? The reason seems to be that Johnson takes it that there are other reasons to believe in God. He writes, If all theists had was the moral argument, their overall case for God's existence would be fairly weak, but that's not the case. The moral argument for God is merely one among many arguments that theists have provided for God's existence. All else being equal, Theists have much more evidence and arguments for God than Wielenberg has for his brute ethical facts. But presumably, being an atheist, Wielenberg doesn't accept those other arguments for theism either, so it's not clear what point there is in bringing them up. It's not as though there aren't plenty of arguments for the existence of abstract objects on offer in the literature. Moreover, Wielenberg may not think that God is a good explanation for morality in any case, so additional arguments for theism from other facts will be irrelevant when it comes to best explaining moral facts. But the salient point is that if the theist has to appeal to other arguments for theism in order to show that God is the best explanation for morality, this is a tacit admission that God is not the best explanation for morality if we are just comparing God to Wielenberg's model.
it looks like the theist can't make the case for theism just based upon morality. He has to appeal to a bunch of other arguments to get there. If so, then it is those arguments, and not the moral argument, which is doing the real justificatory work. And if those other arguments are doing the primary justificatory work, this raises the question of why Johnson didn't write a book defending one of those arguments instead. On the whole, this is a quite puzzling section of the book. I do not know why Johnson thinks that this is an objection to Wielenberg. If anything, it looks like an admission that Wielenberg could explain the data better than Johnson if we were to restrict our considerations to just morality. Moving on to Johnson's second objection to Wielenberg's theory, he claims that brute ethical facts are an unsatisfying ultimate explanation for morality. He says, It boils down to the following question. What is a more plausible ontological ultimate? God or brute ethical facts that are akin to platonic abstract objects? He then goes through several examples of theists and atheists claiming that they find brute ethical facts to be an unsatisfying explanation, and he mentions that some theists, such as Greg Welty, use abstract objects as an argument for theism, and he concludes by saying that Willenberg is free to posit the existence of such brute ethical facts, of course, but it doesn't seem plausible to many theists and atheists that such facts could just exist on their own without any cause or explanation. Now, the way that Johnson has set up the question is already problematic. Things like plausibility and satisfaction are entirely subjective categories. The fact that some people find an explanation satisfying and others do not tells us absolutely nothing about whether it is the best explanation of some set of facts. It's important to remember that plausibility is not the same thing as probability. Probability consists in an objective relation which holds between evidence and a proposition. Plausibility is just a subjective feeling that one has towards some proposition based upon their prior beliefs. It is no wonder that Johnson, being a theist, finds theism more plausible than Platonism, but this does nothing to highlight any explanatory advantage in theism over Platonism. As for his claim that abstract objects might provide an argument for theism anyway, it is interesting that he cites Greg Welty's work here. While I intend to critique James Anderson and Greg Welty's argument for theism from logic in a future video in this series on apologetic arguments, which I avoid, for now, suffice to say that it is not an argument from abstract objects at all. Welty is a divine conceptualist, so he takes things like universals to be ideas in the mind of God. And while these perform the same work as abstract objects within his ontology, because these are actually mental entities, they end up being concrete rather than abstract. As Welty himself admits, I operate with a purely functionalist account of abstract object. I can give my main argument without referencing the term abstract object. I am a realist about these objects, and a conceptualist, and a theist. So if divine ideas are concrete objects, then my position is that abstract objects, functionally speaking, are concrete objects, ontologically speaking. So Welty has not made an argument from abstract objects at all. He has eliminated them from his worldview altogether and replaced them with God's ideas. And it's not all that significant that one can make an argument for God's existence from the premise that God's ideas exist. Furthermore, just because philosophers like Welty have thought that one can make a theistic argument from abstract objects, it doesn't follow that such arguments are ultimately any good. Precisely because divine conceptualism transmutes abstract objects into concrete objects, many philosophers doubt that God's thoughts are up to the challenge of playing the role of abstract objects at all. As William Lane Craig explains, the difficulty then for conceptualism is that God's thoughts as concrete objects are not universals but particulars, and so cannot be wholly present in spatially separated objects. We may, if we wish, take God's ideas or concepts to be the abstract content of God's thoughts, but God's thoughts cannot be abstract objects since they are mental states or events. Johnson's third objection to Wielenberg's model regards its commitment to a making relation wherein moral properties are instantiated by humans having appropriate cognitive faculties. Johnson offers two main objections here. First, he says that the capacities of cognitive faculties would be mere accidents given atheism, 
And second, he says that since human beings have different levels of cognitive faculties, this implies different levels of moral value and responsibility. I don't think that either of these is a serious objection to Wielenberg's view. Why is it a problem if the instantiation of moral properties by cognitive faculties is accidental? Intentional explanations are not inherently better than accidental explanations, as Wielenberg says, if, as I believe, there is no God, then it is in some sense an accident that we have the moral properties that we do. But that they are accidental in origin does not make these moral properties unreal or unimportant. Nor is it clear that having differing cognitive abilities implies a difference in moral value, since Wielenberg is free to posit that some very minimal threshold of cognitive ability grants full moral value to an individual. But even if Johnson were to be right about this point, that would just be a potentially unpleasant implication of Wielenberg's theory. It wouldn't tell us anything at all about how well Wielenberg's theory succeeds as an explanation for moral facts. At worst, we would be left with an unanswered question regarding how moral properties are instantiated. We are still left without any reason for preferring theism over Platonism. Johnson's final objection to Wielenberg's theory is that it leaves the connection between the natural world and the abstract world unexplained. He writes, At least when it comes to understanding how moral properties can be connected to non-moral properties, the idea that the former supervenes on the latter is currently the most popular explanation. However, some have criticized the idea of supervenience by claiming it's not an explanation at all, but merely a filler word used to signify something for which we have no such explanation. Since natural properties are not agents, how do they know which moral properties to instantiate? The question is bizarre, to say the least. On Wielenberg's view, the connection can simply obtain by necessity, without any further explanation, and without anyone or anything needing to know which properties to instantiate. As Wielenberg explains, explanation, as they say, must come to an end somewhere. Why does being an instance of torturing someone just for fun entail moral wrongness? Because being an instance of torturing someone just for fun makes an act wrong. Eventually we hit bottom. No further explanation is available, but I don't see why possessing this sort of explanatory bottom is a problematic feature for a view to have. Indeed, Johnson's question verges on begging the question against Wielenberg in that it assumes that knowledge is necessary for moral properties to be instantiated. But why would anyone who is not already a theist assume that? And if the existence of unexplained relations is a problem for Wielenberg's theory, it seems that it is going to be a problem for Johnson's view too. After all, for Johnson, following Adams, morality consists in a resemblance relation between people and the love of the triune God. We might just as easily ask Johnson, since resemblance relations are not agents, how do they know when to obtain between agents and the love of the Trinity? Surely the answer cannot be that God himself, as a matter of sheer divine volition, creates resemblance relations. Presumably two apples don't resemble one another because God creates a resemblance relation between them. For otherwise, one seems forced to say that God could just as easily create the same sort of resemblance relation between an apple and an orange, but clearly that is wrong. Resemblance relations just obtain between similar objects by necessity, and that's the end of the story. So Johnson is committed to unexplained relations just as much as Wielenberg, meaning that Johnson's theistic hypothesis has no explanatory advantage over Wielenberg's hypothesis on this front either. Johnson sort of anticipates this objection as he goes on for the entirety of chapter 9, attempting to explain the relationship between God's commands and God's nature as one of necessity. But this is different than the issue which I have raised. My concern regards not the relationship between God's commands and God's nature, but rather the resemblance relation between human actions and God's nature, in virtue of which those actions are supposed to be good. Johnson's model leaves this resemblance relation wholly unexplained, thereby making his model just as bloated as Wielenberg's in this way. Throughout all of the pages which Adam Johnson spends offering supposed advantages of his theory over Wielenberg's and supposed problems with Wielenberg's theory, which his theory allegedly avoids, we have not seen an appeal to any of the criteria of a best explanation, at least not explicitly. 
Johnson does not attempt to show that his theory is simpler than Wielenberg's. He does not attempt to show that it has greater explanatory power or greater explanatory scope or provides illumination into some other long-standing problem in philosophy. His method of argumentation has appealed to unjustified criteria, which are supposedly necessary for a theory of morality to be objective. He has referenced other arguments for theism, which are not germane to moral theory. He has appealed to subjective intuitions about Wielenberg's theory being unsatisfying and implausible, and he has objected to Wielenberg's dependence upon unexplained relations, even though his own theory likewise requires them. In over 160 pages of writing, we have not been given a solid reason to see theism as being more probable of an explanation for moral facts than Platonism. Johnson has one final objection to Wielenberg's theory, which is epistemological in nature. He calls it the lucky coincidence objection. He puts the objection in the following syllogistic form. 1. The probability of our cognitive faculties being reliable, given atheism and evolution, is low. 2. If someone believes atheism and evolution, and sees that the probability of our cognitive faculties being reliable, given atheism and evolution, is low, then they have a defeater for their belief that our cognitive faculties are reliable. 3. If someone has a defeater for the reliability of their cognitive faculties, then they have a defeater for any belief produced by their cognitive faculties. 4. Our moral beliefs are produced by our cognitive faculties. 5. Therefore, if someone believes atheism and evolution, then they have a defeater for their belief that their moral beliefs are reliable. Now, as I have indicated earlier in my discussion on moral realism, I don't think that anyone has a reason to believe that their moral beliefs are true. So in one sense, I would be happy to forego this portion of Johnson's argument, since I think that he's going to have the same problem justifying any of his moral beliefs. However, if Johnson can show that his model at least has the built-in resources to in principle account for moral knowledge, and that Wielenberg's theory does not, then even if he has no advantage over Wielenberg when it comes to explaining moral facts, he may yet have an advantage for his overall moral theory. Now I think that this argument which he has offered is problematic, because I think that it relies upon epistemic externalism. As a brief reminder, epistemic externalists do not believe that one needs to be aware of the reasons which justify their beliefs, just as long as certain external conditions, such as their beliefs having been reliably produced, are met. Epistemic internalists deny this, maintaining that there is an awareness requirement on justification. Nevertheless, despite my own rejection of externalism, Johnson's argument is not entirely misplaced when it comes to Wielenberg, since Wielenberg himself embraces an externalist epistemology. As I have argued in my video on internalism and externalism, I think that all externalist theories of knowledge entail global skepticism. So while I agree with Johnson that Wielenberg's epistemology leaves him stuck in skepticism, this is because he embraces externalism, not because he embraces atheism. It seems clear to me, however, that an atheist could embrace Wielenberg's moral ontology while rejecting Wielenberg's moral epistemology and could opt for an internalist theory of moral knowledge. If this is possible, then Johnson won't have any necessary advantage over Wielenberg when it comes to moral epistemology either. However, to show that this is possible, I will have to confront Johnson's argument and show how the internalist can escape the conclusion. Students of philosophy will note the similarities between Johnson's argument and Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. Johnson has merely taken Plantinga's argument and applied it to metaethics. While the first premise of Johnson's argument is, and has been, hotly debated among philosophers ever since Plantinga first proposed it, I am happy enough to grant it for the sake of argument. I would just agree that the probability of our cognitive faculties being reliable given atheism and evolution is low. Instead, my criticisms will focus upon the second and third premises of the argument. I disagree with the second premise. I do not believe that if someone sees that the probability of their cognitive faculties being reliable given atheism and evolution is low, then they necessarily have a defeater for their belief that their cognitive faculties are reliable. This is because any non-zero probability can be overcome by sufficient evidence. So if we were to be in possession of sufficient evidence that our cognitive faculties were reliable, 
then this would overcome the low prior probability. Now Johnson anticipates this move, but thinks that it is ultimately circular. He says, If someone believes atheism and evolution, and then comes to see that the probability of their cognitive faculties being reliable is low in this scenario, it wouldn't be possible for them to use arguments or evidence to try to prove their cognitive faculties are reliable. Such attempts would fail, because to even begin such a move, they'd have to first assume their cognitive faculties were reliable, which is the very issue under consideration. So one of the ways that he tries to uh, defeat Plantinga's argument is he says, look, look at the evidence. I mean, it seems that our cognitive faculties are very reliable. Um, and he gives examples of that, and he says, even though Plantinga's argument concludes that they're not reliable, if evolution and uh, naturalism were correct. However, when we look at the evidence, we see that our cognitive faculties are very uh, mm -hmm. reliable. And you know where I'm going with this, and a lot of people have pointed this out already, that that's, um, that's very circular, because he's using to evaluate the accuracy of his, of his cognitive faculties. What is he using? He's using his cognitive faculties. And so he's using the very thing that's under question. Mm -hmm. he's, he's using the very thing that is potentially defeated or that we're wondering if they're reliable or not to, in order to prove their reliability. And so that, that fails. Now I should note the irony of objecting to someone using circular reasoning to escape a Plantinga-style argument when Plantinga himself thinks that all of our beliefs, and even God's beliefs, are ultimately based upon circular reasoning. But more fundamentally, I don't agree with Johnson that this response to his argument involves circular reasoning. Why would one have to assume that their cognitive faculties were reliable in order to marshal arguments or evidence in support of that proposition? Remember what cognitive faculties are supposed to be. They are our belief-forming faculties. They are the source of our beliefs. It seems to me that Johnson's conclusion only follows if one thinks that beliefs are justified in virtue of having been produced by a reliable cognitive faculty and by nothing else. To see why, consider how an acquaintance theorist might inductively reach the conclusion that their belief sources are reliable. Remember that Johnson is discussing sources of belief and not sources of justification. The two need not be coextensive. For the acquaintance theorist, a belief is non-inferentially justified when one is acquainted with their belief the fact to which their belief corresponds, and the relation of correspondence between their belief and the fact. Notice that whatever source produces this belief, whether reliable or otherwise, plays no role in the justification of that belief. Now suppose that the non-inferential beliefs produced by one's belief sources are consistently accompanied by the three acquaintances necessary for non-inferential justification. Based upon this, one could make an inductive inference on the basis of the continued accuracy of their belief source to the conclusion that their belief source is reliable in the sense that it consistently forms beliefs which are true. Again, this would be justified by the three relevant acquaintances. In no way would such a track record argument be circular, because at no point would it depend upon the premise that one's cognitive faculties are reliable. To reach his desired conclusion, namely that if someone sees that the probability of their cognitive faculties being reliable is low, then they have a defeater for their belief that their cognitive faculties are reliable, Johnson would need to add the premise that a belief is only epistemically justified if it has been produced by a reliable cognitive faculty. However, once the necessary premise to draw Johnson's desired conclusion has been added, the acquaintance theorist would just reject it. There is no reason to grant the assumption that the reliability, or lack thereof, of a source which produced a belief is relevant to the epistemic justification for that belief. As Timothy and Lydia McGrew observe, It is interesting to see how stubborn is the notion that everyone, internalists included, must acknowledge the need for a general reliability requirement of some sort for positive epistemic status. It may be true, as we have already discussed, that a particular set of sufficient conditions for internalist justification, for example, being infallibly non-inferentially known, 
also satisfies a very broadly understood version of a trustworthy source requirement. But the internalist should staunchly insist that coming from a trustworthy, i.e. reliable, source is neither necessary nor in general sufficient for justification. It is not necessary, for an internalist can take a belief to be justified if its source does not in any sense tend to produce true beliefs. It is not sufficient because all of the external conditions one could add neither constitute nor entail that a belief has internalist rationality. And this objection, which I have presented to the second premise, should make it clear why I also reject the third premise that if someone has a defeater for the reliability of their cognitive faculties, then they have a defeater for any belief produced by their cognitive faculties. This premise, once again, assumes that the justification for a belief in some way is determined by the reliability of the processes which produce it. But the internalist need not accept such an assumption. Consider a cognitive faculty which is usually unreliable. It produces false beliefs much more frequently than it does true beliefs. Now suppose that it produces a belief which happens to be true. Moreover, suppose that I am acquainted with the truth maker of that belief as well as the correspondence relation which holds between that belief and the fact which makes it true. In such a case, I have a justified belief even though the source of the belief is fundamentally unreliable. This is because the justification of that belief is being yielded by acquaintance rather than by the reliability of the cognitive faculty which produced it. Richard Fummerton correctly observes, Plantinga and many other externalists are, ironically, forced to take such evolutionary debunking arguments more seriously than the more traditional epistemologist would. The traditional epistemologist will distinguish the causal origins of a belief from the question of whether or not there is available justification to support that belief. The traditional epistemologist recognizes a genetic fallacy with respect to both claims about truth and claims about justification. As a philosopher, I've always thought I should ignore completely Freudian, Marxist, feminist, right-wing, left-wing, or any other psychological theories about why I came to believe what I believe. I don't really care why I came to believe what I believe. I care whether I can find something that would justify me in holding my belief. But the externalist typically can't divorce these causal questions from philosophical questions because all of the critical epistemic concepts are defined in terms of a belief's genesis. I see no reason why an atheist cannot adopt Wielenberg's metaphysical account of moral realism while rejecting Wielenberg's admittedly problematic moral epistemology, provided that one takes themselves to have justification for their moral beliefs on internalist grounds, then they can adopt Wielenberg's moral theory and propose it as the best explanation of morality. Johnson's showing problems with Wielenberg's externalist moral epistemology will not block this move. Therefore, this problem with Wielenberg's epistemology does not provide any reason to think that theism better explains morality than does Platonism. In summary, I think that Johnson's moral theory is highly sophisticated, which enables him, to one degree or another, to evade my first three challenges. However, despite valiant efforts on his part, I do not think that he overcomes the fourth.